Great. Uh, thanks, Gabor. Thank you very much for that uh, moderating that session. I think it was it was really good to hear from uh, people from across the world. We had uh, uh, the time zones really at their extremes, all the way from the one side of the dateline to nearly the other. And um, uh, yeah, thanks to the uh, thanks to the uh, the panel. Uh, yes, we will go and chat to farmers now very soon. Uh, we had this question earlier. It popped up in our interaction with you. Why don't we talk to farmers? Why don't we ask farmers the questions? And we will be doing that very, very soon. Uh, before we do that, um, just to remind you again, join our conversation. Go to slide. This is where we're up from now. The second room in Slido, that's where we will have questions. That's where we will also um, take your questions for the next panel. And um, and uh, also tweet, keep going, keep listening, and keep sharing with us. We are going to have what I would like to call an intergenerational conversation between three farmers from different landscapes, from different generations. Uh, we have Bob Quinn. He's uh, an organic farmer, activist, and businessman from the US. We have Kaluki Paul Motuka, a Marine Reeves, an urban farmer from Uganda. Uh, but before we welcome them live, we're going to have a very, very quick video about the landscapes to show us where they are calling from. After the video, we will start the panel discussion. Great, very, very quick to uh, central equatorial Africa uh, on the eastern side. Uh, yes, and we have our three uh, panelists in our room, um, and we're going to spend time with them for the next, uh, let's say, 30, 30 odd minutes. Um, I would like to start by just letting the panelists introduce themselves. I would like you all to tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, tell us about your farm. And tell us always my most important, important question when I do training with groups, why? Why are we? we start with Lorene, and I'm going to ask her to share with us. And I will be a bit of a hard taskmaster if, we, uh, if we're starting to run a little bit late. I will uh, cut you short. Uh, please forgive me for that. Loreen, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Loreen. Uh, we need to your camera on. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. unmuted. Yes, we can see you. Please go ahead, Lorraine. Good to see you again. Uh, you too. Hi, Conrad. Um, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lorraine. I am a farmer from Uganda. I, we currently, we are family farmers. So I farm with my mom on um, 70 acres in Kayunga. And we currently have about five staff, temporary staff. But we also work with the community where we also source uh, food from. Great. Uh, so that's already, we're talking about intergenerational. You are intergenerational in, on your farm. You and yes. your, uh, your family working together and working with the community. Uh, that's great. It's good to hear that. And uh, I want to move just a little bit across around the uh, Lake Victoria and move uh, down to Kenya and uh, introduce Paul. 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 Uh, uh, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about where you come from, why you farm and how you farm. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kaluki Pon Mutuku and I'm uh, 27 years old. Kenyan youth working with farmers in Machakos uh, under the Green Treasures Farms, where we seek to intensify uh, environmental uh, sustainability through working with different families to train them about organic farming, biodiversity conservation, and of course, 
trying to enhance soil care and how they can improve their uh, livelihoods. And for me, I think it's important to engage in organic farming because it's the very lifeline towards healthy communities and towards a healthy environment. And I think that is my reason for always championing for nature. Thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Motoko. This is uh, uh, yeah, really a healthy lifeline to uh, you know, communities and, and, and our agriculture and environment. I think it's, really, it's a really good, strong reason why we should be doing this. Uh, good, we're going to uh, hop, skip, jump over Africa, move across the, which one is that? The, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, yes. Uh, and move all the way to Montana and welcome Bob Quinn uh, to share a little bit uh, from his side. Bob. Hello, <clears throat> it's great to be here. <clears throat> Well, I have, um, we live on a uh, family um, farm of about um, uh, 1,700 hectares or about 4,000 acres. My grandfather started in 1920. My father uh, was raised here. I was raised here and I raised my children here. So we have um, been farming now this, this farm 100 years. Uh, 30 years ago, I changed uh, to organic, 100% um, organic. And over 30 years, we've been farming organically. I, <clears throat> it's, to me, it's a lot more fun. Um, it's uh, more profitable and it's, uh, it's a great um, source of satisfaction to me because now instead of commodities, we're actually growing food. And to me, that's very important. And we've been able to um, increase our involvement in the community by starting uh, small um, enterprises next to the farm. We, we, do, uh, we have oil. Uh, safflower, made from safflower we grow on the farm, we crush it on our farm, we sell it locally and to university kitchens in, in Montana. Uh, we make snacks with our, um, our ancient grain and we have been able to uh, bring about, uh, create about 10 more jobs in our little small community of Big Sandy which is only 600 people and we've increased the population of that by <clears throat> over 6% in the last uh, 10 to 15 years so we're very excited about that. Great, thanks, Bob. I think it's uh, it's really great to hear that, see that as a few things that you are picking up on now. The one being um, the diversifying of what you're doing, not just farming, but also uh, interconnecting with the value chain and uh, interconnecting with the community beyond that. I think that's a very, very important uh, point. And then I want to pick up on something. This uh, generation uh, you mentioned to me before when we were chatting that in your case, um, uh, your children are not. Uh, taking part in the farming activity. Now, how do you um, overcome that to still incorporate uh, the youth and the generations into farming practice and, and, and into the work that you're doing? <clears throat> well, I have five children and they've all chosen other careers rather than coming back to the farm. And now we have about 19 grandchildren. So I'm hoping maybe one of those would be interested in the next um, um, few decades. But meanwhile, I've decided after farming for 40 years to turn over my farm to the next generation. So I've <clears throat> taken <clears throat> two of, the, two of, the, um, of our employees um, that work, one worked for me for six years, another for two. And uh, I have rented the entire farm to them. So now the next generation is in charge and they are farming organically and building upon what I have taught them. And um, each of them has brought a brother or a brother-in-law in one case. So they have four families now living and being supported by this farm that used to just support one. So we're very excited about that and seeing how the next generation can be involved in, in increasing um, the support of more people in our local community. Great. Yes. So it's not always just about the own family and the own people being involved, but, uh, but reaching out to your community. And I want to actually move that same question across. Uh, and uh, well, let me go to, uh, let me go to uh, Maluki uh, in, uh, in Kenya. You are yourself in the younger generation. You're a millennial. You involve more young people in farming because we know across the world the average age of farmers over 60 years old um, so how do we get uh, young people younger generation involved thank you again Conrad I think that's a very fantastic question and, and to start us off I would like to also display a bit of a hub that I mostly use to train my family and people around me so that they get more interested in, in organic farming or even farming 
So my model is actually to just speak to people in the families, both in rural and urban areas, and try to show them uh, why it's important for them to also exercise sort of uh, farming systems and also just interact with soil, you know, to, to grow your crops. And what that has taught me is that uh, I think we need to change our families' perspectives. People don't farm because they don't know how to. People fail to farm or fail to show uh, interest in farming, maybe because they've not had that uh, experience with soils or with plants. So for me, I take that chance to try to uh, sort of lure my family to embrace farming. And so far it has gone so well for my mom and for my two brothers. It has also gone so well for my little niece who is almost two years. She's always speaking on my hub. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do to just transfer these experiences and to uh, increase uh, interest in farming. And further going on, I think it's important for us to engage the younger generation because the number one thing and fact that we cannot escape is that young people are, as of today, comprising over half of the global population. So we can either take this as a chance to uh, project the next uh, food security measures that the world takes, or we can take it as a cast and always uh, depend on food aid and, and all that. But for me, I think the opportunity lies within our governments, within communities, and within the private sector to actually tap into the potential of young people because we find we, we, most of us young people are really we are energetic, we are passionate, we have the time, and we need uh, the space to explore our skills and, and you know build our skill sets yeah, and, and, and being on the farm I think it's one of the best ways that we can show young farmers how to be cool while farming and still you know uh, stand out you know and, and for me I think that's one thing that stands out and uh, most young people deserve this sort of uh, uh, thought going forward. I like the idea of cool earlier in our previous panel and we must make farming cool and in that way we will also cool the earth by being cool farmers i think we can make a hashtag out of that one yep um okay i'm going to ask loreen a related question and then after that i would like us to actually go live on slido and see what is coming in from people live and just pick the questions from there uh, really um, interact with our audience that are out there loreen earlier when we were chatting a day or so ago you you were saying something about YPAD, and i wanted you to just pick up on that uh, what is YPAD, and how does that inter how does that bring young people into the area specifically uh, the organic one hi loreen uh, you are muted. Okay. I'm going to. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So, YPAD is um, it's a member network, uh, and it's across. So you have members in Africa, you have members in Asia, you have members in Europe, and all these are young people who are involved in agriculture. So they, it, it's a mixture of uh, young people who are farming, um, young people who are in tech, young people who are processors. Uh, and, and so you find that young people are more or less involved. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so you find, um, you find this amazing knowledge base of young people who are involved everywhere along the value chain. Um, because I guess in the past we always thought farming involves, uh, you know, being on the farm and, and doing all the hard work. But the way young people are coming into the sector now is through other avenues. So, you know, having them building apps so they can help farmers to, let's say, uh, get their food from the farm to the market, uh, building apps so that a farmer can identify uh, a, a pest for their tomatoes and how they can treat that pest. Um, so, YPAD really, um, it's, uh, it's a good network, it's a good knowledge base. for anyone who's really involved um, in agriculture. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Lorena. We, we're getting a few uh, dropouts, it seems, a bit of uh, lag in connectivity. Uh, just bear with us. Uh, you know, it goes through waves. Uh, the internet has this amazing way of going through fast 
and slow waves. I don't understand or pretend to understand it. Um, yes, okay, what I would like us to do, and this will be uh, interesting, is really to go to the top popping and as they pop up we all three of us you can jump in and you can you'll now see it in screen sharing uh, uh, my uh, my guys have just uh, put it up there we go we have the top questions uh, from around from brazil from ghana from germany um and there we are we're the first question that the the top voted one at the moment young people from small farmers families are seeking to study and work in the cities how to keep the generations in the field um, who would like to pick up on that one first? Okay, um, I can I can try and answer and maybe mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so in our case, for how do we get young people? So young people from small uh, farmers families uh, who want to study, and then so I guess that is young people who came from a background of family farming and now have kind of abandoned it to go to the city. Um, what we are doing at our farm is we are turning our farm into um, a bit of a learning, a learning, a learning uh, center, I suppose. Um, so we have young people who can come uh, back to our farm and they can, you know, spend time on the farm. They can learn about permaculture. They can learn about waste management. Um, and if they want to then go on and do something within urban, urban agriculture in the city, then they can also, we can try and support them to do that. So I think farming doesn't necessarily have to be in the rural areas. We have more and more young people now who are farming in urban areas as well, um, using you know, limited land and limited resources, but they're still trying to do that in the city. So, um, so I think for us to be able to keep young generations in the field, it's, uh, we can break this myth of farming has to be rural. Farming is now urban. Uh, farming is, you know, it's soilless, it's, uh, it's hydroponics, it's, it's, it's aquaponics, it's everything. Um, and I, I guess once we can break what it means to, you know, to farm, then more and more young people can come on board um, and do that as well. Great. I think I want to take it over to Kenya and, uh, and ask uh, Kaluki about this as well. Uh, you being a young urban farmer and working, uh, working in that environment, how do you see that? And then maybe Bob pick up on the same or any of the other questions that you feel you would like to answer that you can see on the screen. But um, Faluki, just uh, following mm -hmm. on with uh, what Lorene said. Definitely, yes. Uh, just to add to what Lauren says, I think it's also important for us to recognize that times are changing and they're actually changing fast. And, and we find most of the modern education usually takes place in, in urban centers. So that's how you get uh, some of the best universities and all that. So I think on the one side, it's important to, for us to allow these young people to also move to the cities to access and acquire this education. But I think that young people owe it to the world and they deserve to think about where do we go and exercise or practice this knowledge that we got in the urban centers. And that is where I want to share my story with them that for me, I started Green Treasures Farms uh, in 2014. And back then I was still a second year in my university. And the reason I did this is because, well, I had already practiced so much uh, internships with companies, and I really wanted something better for myself. I mean, how best to do this if not going to nature. So that is sort of what uh, made me go back to my rural area and pursue Green Treasures Farms. <coughs> And I think uh, if we can make young people also see, like I said previously, how cool farming can be, then it could be a good incentive for them to join farming. And the other thing, I think it's important for us to also encourage the intergenerational dialogues. For instance, most young people don't want to do the farming because either, uh, it looks too tedious or, I mean, from the older generation's perspectives, I mean, it's too mechanical. But with the knowledge that we acquire in the universities, we can go back to our rural areas get some of the traditional knowledge from our elders and from our older farmer communities in our, in our societies, and then incorporate that with the uh, new knowledge acquired in our studies and not implement in our own uh, perspectives. Uh, and I, I draw the example of Green Treasures Farms where we have a demonstration farm 
uh, were actually farmers, both young family farmers and community have come and exchange ideas, learn from us, and also have that sort of uh, exchange amongst their farms. And that way you actually make farming cool, you make farming inclusive, and you make it so much more to want to learn from each other. I mean, we are a social species, and that is what farmers, farmers should also be informing from, from a perspective of a young farmer. Thank you. This uh, of, of us being social species, and at the moment we have all the social distancing, but we are we we cutting across that by uh, interacting with people from around the world and interacting across the continents, even if we uh, uh, are doing it virtually. Bob, any thoughts from your side on that, or any of these other questions that you see here displayed oh. that you would like to tackle? All right, well, good. One thing that we <laughs> see in our area, especially with average size, which our farm is an average size farm or smaller farms, the um, the father, in the case who was running it in most cases, or the parents, uh, discouraged their children from even thinking about coming back to the farm, saying there was no future in, in, in these smaller or average size or medium farms. And I think what we really have a great opportunity to, to share with people um, that they don't have to farm in the old, well, the, the old chemical way, but they can increase the value of what they grow or add um, enterprises to their farm to make higher value crops that uh, families can be supported by. And one thing we try to do, I, I made a, a movie about um, what we've done on our farm with all kinds of other enterprises. And I knew we only had a few more minutes, so I just, I wrote a book and that's about our stories about um, experimenting and, and adding um, enterprises to the farm so that there's lots of things that can be done. And just by going organic, uh, we are into markets uh, that are three or four times more profitable than the uh, commodity um, chemical markets. And, and if we could encourage people to look at the opportunities and then provide them with um, examples of how to convert and uh, support when they're trying to convert, I think we could have a lot more interest in uh, converting to organic and having uh, the children and the, and, the, and the younger people seriously consider coming back to their farms or going into agriculture, even if they don't have a family farm. Thanks, Bob. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm in this idea that, you know, we, uh, to me, it's got to do with a system. It's got to do with a systematic approach. It's this narrow view that what we're doing is farming. And that means, uh, you know, being somewhere in the soil, digging away and trying to uh, coax something out of the soil. But farming is part of a food system and we can all be part of an organic food system. And we can tap in on different places and different uh, entry points into the system. There is, once we get away from this idea of simplifying farming into something that just happens in a specific place done by specific people, I think that starts making a very, very big difference. There's, um, so we have another 10 minutes and we're having a really great conversation here. Uh, if you look at this, uh, there, there's a question here about digital technologies. I would like to pick up on that one. Anybody wants to pick up and say, you know, how do we, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, how can digital uh, technologies support organic farming and are they suitable to organic farming principles? <laughs> Who wants I to take that one? Yeah, Conrad, well, I can say a little bit of something about that. I, mm -hmm. I'm uh, sort of on the end of the, or the beginning of the technological um, uh, digital phase. I didn't really embrace it wholeheartedly, but um, I did install some satellite tracking on our tractors and I found that I could really um, enable me to farm much better at night, uh, which we were forced to do sometimes and we were under um, uh, extreme um, uh, time duress with storms coming and we had to get our crops in and that really helped a lot. Um, I, I don't think that uh, we should uh, trade technology for our own two eyes however and, and looking and seeing what's going on in our fields and, and, and thinking about it and getting ideas. I think we should um, use uh, digital technologies as a um, another tool uh, not a not a dominant tool but another tool to help us farm better but not be the uh rely on it for as a, as a substitute for um a good thinking and good um uh, observation and and decision making on our farms 
Great. Yes, I think it's, uh, uh, again, it's this uh, issue of balance. I think uh, uh, Kaluki wanted to say something. You want to, to add to this, talking about digital technologies in farming? Yep. Yes, yes, definitely. And maybe to add to Bob's point, I think we should appreciate the fact that we are living in a digital era and technology is really helping us some of, uh, solve some of our uh, current global problems. And, and especially in, in the farming sector, I think uh, there are new applications coming up to help farmers uh, track or know when a drought, you know, or famines are coming. And these are sort of some of these technologies that we must always incorporate and appreciate that they are there for us, even in the organic farming uh, uh, sector. Number two, I think we also have new softwares. Uh, and, you know, in my case, I talk about Twigger platform, which, which is actually funded by the UN and the FAO. And what this does is that Trigger connects uh, farmers to buyers. So you as a rural farmer, in, I mean, for my case in Kenya, I don't have to be worried about uh, if I have a bamba harvest, how do I get this to the market? This particular Trigger platform gives me that kind of, uh, uh, of uh, opportunity to market my products and tell them when they'll be ready for harvest. And then uh, Trigger people will come and pick my produce and go and sell it at the market price. So number one, it eliminates the middle people. And then on the other side, it gives you some very nice uh, uh, income, which is good for the farmer and profitable to the whole livelihood uh, situation. Also, I think it's good for us to leverage on online platforms to create uh, farmers engagement and also create platforms for online uh, organic farmers market. And this way we can then keep the conversation going and, you know, ensure that technology is working for us and not against us in the, in the food security sectors. Great, thanks for that. Okay, I am going to go back to some of the questions here. This will be our last round of questions and then we will wrap up. I think I... Melissa was asking, uh, what barriers are the two young farmers facing when it comes to farming in Uganda or Kenya? And how are they overcoming these challenges? I'm going to take this to Bob too, because uh, even in the US, there are major barriers to entry. But uh, yeah, um, really quickly from you, what were the barriers and how did you overcome them? <coughs> Laureen, maybe you could start. Okay. Yes, you are, you are live. Okay. Um, I think one of the, the biggest barriers for not just young farmers, but farmers in general, is access to market. Um, that is a really big problem. Um, and I believe that access to market, the problem also comes about because there's a disconnect between the consumer and the farmer. Um, I feel that consumers and farmers uh, are not kind of talking to one another because we still do not know, there's not transparency in our food systems. So one of the big problems is accessing the market. When you have the produce, but getting it to the final consumer, uh, and I guess like Paul mentioned, the middleman, the middleman is the way for the consumer to access food. But once the consumer comes back, once the consumer now makes this connection back to the farmer and they buy directly from the farmer, then I believe that will more or less solve our problem of access to markets because then you know who you're getting your food from. Uh, and this transparency then also helps for you to know, is my food organic? Uh, what did the farmer use on their farm? What did they spray? What did they not spray? So you can have all these questions answered. Uh, and, and for as long as we have transparency, for as long as we have this, um, this understanding of, of our markets, of where our food comes from, I believe that will remove some of the barriers uh, for accessing markets for young farmers and farmers in general. Great, thanks, uh, Laureen. Yes. Connecting people, connecting farmers to markets, but connecting farmers to consumers and creating, uh, uh, and here again is where technology and uh, digital, the digital age can really, really help us. I'm going to take this, this question for a few uh, more thoughts from, uh, Maluki, and then I'm going to go to Bob for one more question, and we're going to wrap up. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, and just for viewers, let me remind you that my real names are Kaluki. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I understand. So 
of course, like, like uh, it was mentioned by Lorraine, uh, one of the issues is actually access to the markets and, and the financial uh, segments to it. Of course, it comes from the point of investments. At times as a young farmer, you might not be privileged to have the uh, starting capital, you know? And, and so it also becomes a bit of a challenge as you try to crowd, uh, crowdsource and also get together resources to set up your, your uh, farm going. The other challenge uh, will, of course, be around land. Uh, that at times, you come from families that, uh, you know, they've occupied pretty much most of the land. And so getting some ample land, piece of land to conduct or uh, carry out farming becomes a problem. And for me, I think that's what made me want to work more with other farmers as opposed to making everything under our family the farmland. So this way, you kind of go above those challenges. And the final one, I think, also then trying to balance because I'm not 100% a farmer, I'm also a professional on other sides. So that sort of finding a balance, I think, for young people becomes a challenge. But then that's why you need to, of course, work with a support system. In this case, uh, other farmers and family that can really come in handy and help you uh, navigate through the whole uh, situation. Thanks, Kaluki, uh, and my apologies for, I also made typos on my... Of course. <laughs> think this is, again, proof that we are live. Um, yep, okay, uh, I want to go back to, um, uh, to Bob. There was one question uh, here from Anne in, uh, in Germany, uh, asking how organic farming is more profitable, and uh, uh, how did you start in the market 30 years ago? Well, this is probably a half an hour story, but uh, <laughs> I would like you to just... <laughs> Just pick up on this a little bit, you know, how, how are you seeing it as being more profitable? And then after that, I will give you each a, a short space of time to make a final, uh, share a final thought with us before we close. Well, thank you, Conrad. Well, first of all, um, we were able to reduce our inputs by about three quarters. Um, one of the reasons uh, farmers, particularly in America, are going broke uh, so quickly these days is because of the high cost of inputs and the amount of inputs we're told we have to have for chemical uh, farming. Uh, when we reduce our input costs by three quarters by substituting all the chemicals that we used to buy and put on our farm by raising our own fertilizer with using legumes that we worked into the ground, um, uh, that was an enormous advantage of reducing costs. And then we were able to find markets that were willing to pay two or three times the uh, market price for commodities for actual organic grains. And that's where I started. I, I um, uh, started going to food shows and uh, looking for markets. I, for one farm, you don't need too many markets to get started. And we, we were very fortunate to find some bakeries that were looking for high quality wheat in the beginning. And that's, and that's what we started with, just a couple bakeries. And uh, we built upon that. Um, I, I, I didn't have a lot of money to go out and create a, a market. So we just did a lot of um, networking with friends and with um, word of mouth. And that's the way we were able to build it, just kind of brick by brick. And um, now, 30 years later, it's a, it's a much different situation. And the market has uh, much more opportunities. But um, we didn't, uh, we didn't give up and we just kept going and we adapted to the changing market and we kept building upon the experiences and the um, opportunities that we, had saw, we, we saw coming. Great, thank you so much. What I'm going to do now is the last round is just think about this uh, carefully. There was one question here and maybe I'll use that question uh, for us as a final thought. Literally one sentence each on this question, how, can the younger generations convince the old boomers? Uh, <laughs> myself in this broader perspective of you, convince the older generation to shift. Uh, Kaluki, do you, have, do you have an idea on how we can do this? I certainly do. And, and I just let people know I'm an activist <laughs> in my other world. <laughs> So I would like to tell the older generation that I think we deserve a system change. We deserve to move away from a capitalistic sort of a system that has obviously told us that profit is more important than systems. It's more important than nature and it's more important than, than communities. 
So we need to rethink our systems and we need to learn from COVID-19 that we are nothing without nature. We are nothing without nature. And again, we are what we eat. So if we can embrace organic farming within our reach, then we are definitely teaching the older generation that you know what, we got it covered and you either join us or we just let you go and continue doing it. But I hope that everyone can join us and we can learn from each other, just like here we've had the intergenerational conversation, which is so important for us. Perfect, thank you so much. And uh, Laureen, uh, last thought from you. Um, last thought, well, um, with regards to that question, I feel it's the other way around. I feel um, it's the older generation that needs to convince the, young, the younger generation to return to our old ways of farming. That's what we need. I mean, we were farming organically before. We were doing it right before. And it's only with, you know, with the change of the world that we've now reverted to different ways of farming. But I feel that the current generation ought to learn from the older generation. We ought to go back to how we did farm before. Uh, and then we can avoid everything. You know, we can avoid. Uh, so we need to learn a lot from, from Bob. Um, we need to learn a lot, you know, from, from the, the people in Latin America who are farming organically, like they were farming before their, you know, older generations. Um, and I guess if I could uh, perhaps close off with one sentence, just to urge people to, um, to think global and act local, uh, because for, if we can do that, that will completely change our food systems and how we source and consume our food. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, last word, last word to Bob before I close the session. Bob, <laughs> over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd say there's two ways to do this. First of all is to buy more organic. Um, let, the, let the customers, let the, um, the shoppers tell the older generation and all the, all the farmers that the, that the demand in the future is with organic. It's in America the only uh, segment of agriculture that's growing. And the more we support that, the more people start to um, seriously consider it. Um, I've had uh, more calls from older farmers, probably of my age, in the last um, 18 to 24 months than I had in the last 30 years, asking me about ideas of converting to organic because what they see is this thing we call conventional. This isn't conventional at all. What we've been doing <clears throat> in agriculture for the last 10,000 years, that's conventional, just like Lorraine was saying. Um, what we've been doing the last 70 years is a huge chemical agricultural experiment. And we're seeing that the wheels are coming off that bus, that um, uh, agricultural technical chemical bus. Uh, we have all kinds of pollution problems. We have uh, weeds resistant to herbicides. We have farmers that are going broke because they can't afford these inputs. We have um, health problems. We have pollution problems. So we can see that we're really going in the wrong direction. And I think the sooner that everybody appreciates that and are given opportunity and information of how to change, they will begin to change. Change will come, whether through disaster or design, the change yes. will come and it's up to us <clears throat> to decide. Take. And I want to thank you all for that. Thank you so much. I think it was really great. Uh, we responded to some of the questions we got on Slido, but I'm glad that we could go there and uh, see what people are thinking and feeling. And please continue to feedback on Slido. So thanks to all of you, Bob, Kaluki, uh, Laureen. Uh, thank you for your input. Uh, we will keep contact. Uh, we'll keep on uh, sharing and we'll keep on uh, maybe answering more questions offline and through our blog and through uh, Facebook. Uh, so uh, keep on with the conversation. Um, we are moving into well. Um, I would like to, I'm just looking at my screen here, we're going to have a video uh, now, another video as a transition will give us a chance to grab a cup of coffee. I think I need one. I'm sure many of you do too. Uh, we need some coffee need a break and then there's a video about uh, we unite thank you i can't find my place on it's so good to have it there's actually a team behind here and they wave at me and they show me things uh, and it really <laughs> that really keeps me going the video is called we unite it is a 14 minute video
Uh, two organic farmers would drive their tractors into the center of Berlin to demonstrate and campaign for a better uh, food and farming system for all. And while you watch the video, post comments, go on Twitter. Uh, and after the video, we will be uh, back with our final panel talking about uh, um, food without farmers. Enjoy the video. wie wir Landwirte. Ich heiße Hanna Erz. Wir sind hier in Brandenburg, im östlichen Brandenburg, also im ganz östlichen Teil von Deutschland. Wir sind hier auf dem, auf dem Standard seit 2016. Wir haben diesen Betrieb hier gekauft. Wir halten Legehennen. Die Eier verkaufen wir komplett ab Hof. Dann bauen wir eben noch Gemüse, wie jetzt Kürbisse an, dann Kartoffeln und dann halten wir eben noch die zwei Kühe. Ich bin in einem Dorf aufgewachsen, wo es im Nachbardorf eben viele Landwirte gab und ich fand es irgendwie faszinierend. Damals war es aber schon ein bisschen unüblich, dass den Beruf Frauen ergreifen. Habe aber dann auch mit der Zeit Frauen kennengelernt, die eben auch den Beruf zur Landwirtin gemacht hatten und habe mich deswegen auch entschlossen, dass ich den Beruf zur Landwirtin machen möchte. Ökolandbau funktioniert in meinen Augen nur als geschlossener Organismus. Und wir haben halt Kleegräser bzw. Wiesen, deren Aufwuchs äh, weder wir Menschen direkt essen könnten, noch Schweine oder Geflügel. 
Insofern brauchen wir dringend Wiederkäuer wie Rinder oder Schafe oder Pferde, die sozusagen dieses Gras und diese Silage verwerten und daraus dann Mist machen, den wir dann gezielt zu den Kulturen auf die Ackerflächen bringen können, wo dieser Mist dann gebraucht wird. Wir ernähren Bakterien, auf das die Bakterien die Pflanzen ernähren, die Pflanzen die Tiere und dann geht das Ganze wieder zurück. Wir haben jetzt ein, einfach auch gemerkt, wenn wir ökologisch arbeiten, dass wenn wir längerfristig gut mit unserem Boden umgehen, dass dann die Erträge auch jetzt nicht deswegen schlecht sind, sondern ich glaube, das können, können wir auch andere ökologisch wirtschaftliche Betriebe eben bestätigen, dass die Erträge eben auch im Ökolandbau sehr gut sein können. Ob der Klimawandel nun menschengemacht ist oder nicht, hatten wir im vorletzten Jahr eine Sintflut und im letzten Jahr eine Dürre. Und weil wir den Betrieb bewirtschaften, wie wir es tun, haben wir überhaupt was geerntet, während die konventionellen Betriebe um uns rum in der Trockenheit verdorrt sind. Nach meinem Eindruck spielen Landwirte sowohl in Deutschland als auch weltweit eine immer geringere Rolle. Und das spiegeln auch die Zahlen wieder. Wir haben allein in den letzten zehn Jahren 25 Prozent aller europäischen Landwirtschaftsbetriebe verloren. Und je weniger Landwirte es gibt, desto weniger werden Landwirte natürlich auch wahrgenommen. Wenn es nur noch einen Landwirtschaftsbetrieb in fünf oder zehn Orten gibt, dann sehen die einzelnen Leute den, den Landwirt nur noch auf dem Traktor vorbeifahren. Aber es ist keine Interaktion. Demzufolge verliert die Bevölkerung natürlich auch den Kontakt zur Landwirtschaft. Draußen wie im letzten Jahr die größte Dürre herrscht, aber man in den Laden geht und man bekommt problemlos Milch und all die Produkte, dann hat man natürlich als Verbraucher auch nicht den Eindruck, als wenn Landwirtschaft eine Rolle spielen würde. Weil es ist ja immer alles da. Und deshalb ist es so unheimlich wichtig, dass Bauern Zugang zu Land haben. Und wir diesen weltweiten Konzentrationsprozessen, die gerade im Gange sind, dass immer weniger große Betriebe immer mehr Fläche bewirtschaften, dass wir den Einhalt gebieten. einfach vorstellen, wir sind jetzt hier 20 Jahre am Kämpfen. Alles, was drei Generationen erwirtschaftet haben, steckt in diesem Hof drin. Wenn wir diesen Hof verlieren, verlieren wir alles, was wir jemals besessen haben. Ich habe keinen B-Plan, ich weiß nicht wohin. Also bei der Demo sind wir quasi seit der ersten Veranstaltung mit dabei. Und jedes Mal, jedes Jahr erneut wieder mit neuer Begeisterung, weil sich dann eine, eine immer größere Massenbewegung daraus entwickelt hat. Erst waren es sozusagen nur die Landwirte, die auf ihre Misere hingewiesen haben. Mittlerweile strömen unendliche andere Organisationen zusammen, die das alles von unterschiedlichen Blickwinkeln betrachten, aber trotzdem in die gleiche Richtung marschieren. Mich ermutigt es das einfach, dass so viele Landwirte eben nach Berlin kommen und dann mit ihren Traktoren fahren, um sich eben für eine bessere Landwirtschaft in Deutschland einzusetzen. Wir sind ja hier nur stellvertretend für viele, viele tausend Betriebe, denen es nicht anders geht. Wir sind nur einer der wenigen, die den Mund aufmachen und in die Öffentlichkeit gehen und über ihr Schicksal berichten. Druck auf die Landwirtschaft und dieses ganze ausbeuterische Landwirtschaftssystem mittlerweile einfach so groß ist, dass die Leute die Systemfrage stellen und einfach sagen, wollen wir wirklich so weitermachen? Nein. Ja, und mit Hilfe des Ökolandbaus und diverser anderen Richtungen kann man auch zeigen, wie es denn anders gehen könnte. Ja. 
alleine umsetzen, nicht alleine Ich glaube, das ist der Fokus der Landwirtschaft der Zukunft. Es geht nicht mehr darum, die Bevölkerung satt zu machen. Es geht nicht mehr darum, Masse zu produzieren, sondern es geht ganz klar darum, dass öffentliches Geld auch für öffentliche Leistungen ausgegeben wird. Und genau das ist der Punkt. Artenschutz, Klimaschutz, auch dass es allen Beteiligten in dem System gut geht. Also ich denke, Verbraucher können Landwirte am besten unterstützen, indem sie eben direkt beim Landwirt einkaufen. Wir haben eine immer aufgeklärtere Verbraucherschaft und die gibt mir wahnsinnig viel Hoffnung. Es ist seit langer, langer Zeit nie so viel über Lebensmittel diskutiert worden und wie sie entstehen. Und wir haben gerade in der Jugend einen ganz großen Shift weg von Fett und Zucker und Masse hin zu Bio, lokal, regional, äh, gesunder Ernährung. Und das gibt mir unheimlich viel Hoffnung für die Zukunft. Wir Landwirte müssen uns zusammentun mit all den Menschen, die mit uns gemeinsam aufstehen für unseren Zugang zu Land, gutem Essen, faire Preise und damit eine bessere Zukunft für uns alle. We are back with you. I hope you enjoyed the short film. Um, and now I would like to just quickly pop into the slider room again, see what is happening there um, uh, before I close it and move. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of farmers or would-be farmers or urban farmers online because if you look at how many people are growing food at home, 56 percent of our responders say yes, and the other 28 says they would love, love to, and only 16 percent says no. Okay, well, that's cool. That's a very positive vibe. We want to get a few more of the people saying no, so we can convince you to say yes. Uh, so please <laughs> tell us uh, if you are, aha, suddenly, a uh, little bit of an update happening live as we are uh, streaming in. So yes, uh, that's Slido. We will continue on Slido. We will also for the next panel on Slido. Um, and we would also like to close room two now and ask you to move to room three in Slido uh, because that's the room for our last conversation of the day. And there's a word cloud there that we would like you to, uh, to think about how you see the future of food. And um, uh, yeah, and then uh, post your questions and remember to tweet. Remember to connect, uh, to connect and communicate. We, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, some of you might have joined us later in the session, and uh, I would like to invite again, before we go to the last panel, uh, Louisa Lutikolt, uh, just to talk again about iFarm Organics International, what we do, why we do it, and why we are collaborating with the Global Landscapes Forum on this event. Louise, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much, Conrad, for this opportunity. Um, so IFOM, Organics International, is the global agent of change for true sustainability in agriculture, value chains, and consumption, in line with the principles of organic agriculture. 
And so we are an association and we work with and also on behalf of our members. And there are about 800 organizations in over 120 countries worldwide. And all these organizations have in common that they subscribe to the principles of organic agriculture, which is the principle of uh, health, ecology, fairness and care. And we heard about that earlier this afternoon or today. And what we want is that more farmers practice organic agriculture and similar approaches like agroecology and also that more consumers have the opportunity to eat healthy, nutritious, organic food. We also want that organic agriculture in itself can be better so that we can increase the contribution to the sustainable development goals and our common goods. And with doing so, we also want to inspire the rest of agriculture, those farmers who are not or not yet organic, uh, so that they can also take on practices and uh, principles of organic agriculture to be more sustainable in the end. And so what we do is we provide capacity and leadership development we provide accurate communication and also campaigning to multipliers like our Honest Food campaign. And very important is also that we advocate and provide competence for a favorable policy environment for organic. And uh, if we talk about policies, we think they should include the true societal costs of actually the public baths that the externalities of chemical industrial agriculture represent. So we're very happy to work now with the Global Landscapes Forum because their current theme on food and livelihoods directly relate to our work to promote organic agriculture. And we know from experience and also from scientific studies that uh, practicing agroecological and organic agriculture actually positively contributes to the livelihood of farmers and the majority of them are smallholders. And maybe when preparing for this uh, session today, I was thinking about that we could also have a notion of livelihood of landscapes or maybe even foodscapes. Because as long as we know people have related to their natural environment, we are part of it for our very survival. And many landscapes have functioned as foodscapes for this purpose. But actually currently we're on a dangerous path uh, we don't no longer uh, respect the interrelation between livelihoods of both humans and landscapes. So the Global Landscapes Forum therefore rightly puts the focus on how to survive in the Anthropocene. And we from iFarm Organics International are convinced that such survival is possible only in relation and in interrelation with our agroecological landscapes and by respecting planetary boundaries. Thank you, Conrad. Back to you. Thank you, Louise. Thanks for the message and thanks for putting us back into the context of what we are doing here today. We're nearly ready for our final panel discussion for the day. Um, before we do that, just want to pop into Slido, uh, see what is happening there, and remind you once again, tweet, hashtag eat honest. Um, uh, talk to us, tell us what's happening. Future in 20 years time of food, organic, yep, healthy, fair, local. I think that's a very interesting topic when we start looking at these things, lo being locavores, um, being sustainable, fair, organic locavores, uh, a lot of adjectives to describe our food systems and it's constantly updating. Biodiversity, I think is one that should maybe up a bit and regenerative. These things are a very important part of what we do but local seems to be uh, important to you guys out there. Uh, keep on tweeting, keep on sharing your thoughts. And uh, in Slido room three, uh, when we move on now, you can post your questions to our panel. Um, we will use it during the discussion. We'll also harvest your questions from there. And um, we uh, will try and answer as many as we can through our other media over the, last, uh, over the next number of days. Our final panel discussion today is about food without farmers. Is this the future we want? This is the question that we're posing. And uh, I'm very happy to hand over to uh, Dr. Peter Menang, who will moderate the session. Unfortunately, at the moment, we seem to have a problem with Peter's um, camera, but Ke uh, Peter is live, he is uh, audible. 
and uh, he will moderate the session. Uh, Dr. Menang leads the landscape's governance theme and is the global coordinator of the ASB partnership for the tropical forest margins at the World Agroforestry Center. And he has more than 20 years experience working on climate change, forestry, and landscapes in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And I'm very, very happy to welcome him to uh, moderate our session with a really great group of panelists. Over to you, Peter.